Okay, perfect. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's actually uh, fantastic to be back here at the Asia Society event. And uh, I'm just discovering this uh, Ministry of New, which is a fabulous venue, which I haven't uh, visited before. Um, I want to kind of begin by giving you some context to um, how we ended up actually writing this particular book that we're releasing this week, which is called Do Better With Less. Actually, seven years ago, we had another event with the Asia Society where we actually uh, celebrated our first book, which is called the uh, Jugad Innovation. Many of you may have heard about that. So that is the first book which is based on uh, almost five years of research that uh, Jadip and I did when we were at Cambridge University together, uh, where we actually came to India to document some of the frugal innovations happening here. We looked at of innovations happening at different levels, whether it's the grassroots level, uh, people like uh, Mansuk Prachapati, who was mentioned in the invitation that you received, was a porter uh, in Gujarat who has come up with this fridge made entirely of clay. Uh, we looked at people like uh, Harish Hande in uh, South India, who is actually providing clean energy to extremely poor people in remote villages, for example. Uh, we also looked at uh, multinationals like uh, G, who have developed low-cost medical devices as well out of India like an uh, ECG device, for example, that costs 10 times less and is five times lighter. So that was the kind of first book which celebrated the frugal ingenuity of Indians that we know as Jugad. And then we found something intriguing happening in the West, is the fact that even the West, there is a need to do more and better with less. Uh, this is due uh, to the growing awareness of climate change. Uh, the fact that there is also a lot of inequality in the Western world, as you know, there are about 60 million people in Europe uh, who are below the poverty line. Or in the US, for example, you have uh, almost like 70 million Americans who don't have access to a bank account or have a debit card or credit card. So there we begin to notice that there is also frugal innovation which is emerging in the Western world but it's being driven with a different kind of approach. And uh, this new approach is actually what we call a frugal economy, which is a new economy that actually rests on three pillars. Um, the first one is the sharing economy. You have heard about things like you know, car sharing and apartment sharing. So that's the sharing economy, the first pillar. The second pillar is what we will be focusing really today, which is the maker movement. Uh, this is actually a, a democratization of the innovation whereby everyday citizens now have access to both technologies, platforms, and communities now to actually innovate uh, very frugally, faster, better, cheaper. And then the third pillar is what we call the circular economy, which is the idea of you know, reusing, recycling resources and reducing waste. And this is something that uh, emerged in Europe and is now expanding globally. Uh, will have a huge impact for us um, in the developing world as well. Uh, things like recycling plastic, etc., is going to become very important. And again, we have uh, Mega will be talking about that as well in terms of uh, going beyond just recycling and talking about what we call upcycling as well. So this is the third pillar, which is the circular economy. So that's something we documented in another book we published in 2015. And then uh, <laughs> everything is coming full circle. So uh, we kind of uh, spent last four years actually looking at uh, some interesting thing happening is the fact that actually climate change is getting worse. Um, and we all know that this is affecting both the rich countries and the poor countries. So we begin to notice that these global problems are not any more specific to either the north or the south, rich, poor, etc., man, woman, it affects everybody. Uh, and this is something the United Nations has captured um, under the label of uh, Sustainable Development Goals. These are 17 goals they identified, uh, which actually look at how do we provide clean access to you know, water, sanitation, uh, gender parity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what is fascinating is that <laughs> there are a couple of data points to, to remember. Uh, it's estimated that uh, we need about $5 trillion to achieve these Sustainable Development Goals and we have a shortfall of $2.5 trillion. And there's no way that in a developing world like India, we're going to marshal the $2.5 trillion that easily uh, to address these goals. So clearly, we have to figure out a kind of frugal way to achieve these goals. And this is where we found this incredible data point that we were very excited uh, to include in this book as well. It turns out that 50% of the contribution to these SDGs in the next decade will have to come from India. So that means that the 
planet's kind of a future in a way hinges on India's development the next 10 years, okay? So if India were to go sustainable, global, global I mean, the world has to go sustainable, India has to go sustainable, okay? So this is where we realize that, you know, it's time for us to come back to India and actually have this uh, discussion with you through our book to figure out how can we in India actually build this new economy which is uh, resting on these three pillars of sharing, making, and reusing and recycling. And specifically today, we are going to have a focus on the maker movement that uh, you'll hear from uh, three of our panelists. And uh, Jadeep will be here also to discuss how this phenomenon is uh, happening in the Western world and see what kind of uh, synergies are possible between West and India as well. Um, what is exciting for me to have these three panelists as a segue into the discussion is that uh, every time we come to India uh, in the last seven years, uh, we kind of uh, present these incredible innovators. And the first question always, right, is uh, this is all nice, but can they scale up their solution, right? So uh, the good news is that these three uh, people here, they are not innovators. Um, we call them the meta innovators. That means they are building a platform for many other frugal innovators to flourish. That's why these three folks are really incredible uh, folks to hear from. So I want to uh, begin with uh, each of you actually to take maybe uh, three minutes, just three minutes. We have a limited time, so you have to be frugal in time. Uh, to tell us a bit more uh, why, uh, maybe with Mega, we can start with you. Uh, what was the kind of uh, inspiration for starting Daravi Market, what it is, and what kind of uh, services you provide? Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I started dharavimarket.com, which is basically a website uh, bringing all the Karigars living in the slums of Dharavi online. And uh, so all of them are making several products, be it bags, shoes, accessories, various products. So we were the first ones four years ago to take them online. And we did this by simply uh, launching a website and a mobile app. With the mobile app was specifically for the carriers, for the craftsmen, because they don't own laptops and computers. So they all had access to a smartphone. And what they could do is just click pics of their product and put it up on our website. And it was available for sale across the world. So that was uh, the most amateur uh, version of our website four years ago. Uh, the, the whole point was, I, mean, I am a journalist urban planner by profession, and I've worked as a journalist and an urban planner for seven years before I started this website. Uh, so my whole intention of taking, uh, and Dharavi was one of my urban planning projects. I was actually studying transport and communication patterns over there and commute patterns over there. And so that's when I interacted with the community uh, for a very long time, for six months from more 6 a.m. till 12 in the night, I, I used to spend time living in the houses, just figuring out what their schedules are, how the goods are taken in, how the goods are manufactured, what's the pr process, and interacting with the community. Uh, so, I mean, and I understood a lot about them. I bought stuff for myself personally, just like wallets and belts, and I always wondered if I ever wanted to get this again. I'm not going to walk into these lanes again to come and shop from here. And of course, uh, in 2012, uh, when the idea struck, I mean, Snapdeal and Flipkarts were there. So I knew there was a system where, you know, uh, things could be bought online and delivered at the doorstep. So uh, that was the whole idea. It's been four years now. Um, we were the first ones to take Dharavi online, and it's given them an incredible boost. We've started getting orders from across the world, and not just uh, retail orders, bulk orders. In fact, B2B is now our major business, and we are uh, people, brands from abroad are coming to us for manufacturing. Uh, so, so instead of going to China or, or Bangladesh, there are influencers, bloggers from America, from Canada, who want to start their manufacturing line, and they don't want to start with 10,000 bags, which what China offers, but what they can come to us for 100 bags and 500 bags. Uh, our strength is doing uh, smaller quantities. Uh, which not uh, the larger setups offer. So that's, that's I figured out, is our differentiator model, and that's how we plan to take this forward. Yes, some of the products in display, I yes, guess, Yes, we've in the displayed some of our uh, vegan leather products. We've not got our leather products here because it is They're beautiful, by the way. Just yeah. check them. Really amazing Thank you. stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mega. So, Vaibhav, tell us more about yourself and uh, this thing called, uh, what is that, Maker's Asylum, I guess, uh -huh. in Andheri. So what, what is that? <laughs> 
Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I run this place called Makers Asylum. It started about five years back out of a hobby of mine and about a need for creating a space for people like myself to uh, share tools and be able to prototype and uh, make things. Uh, eventually, however, a lot of people started coming to us, which was uh, beautiful. We started off in a small little garage in Bandra. About a first base was about 100 square feet, then 250 square feet. But slowly, slowly, we progressed ourselves into a nice uh, big space in Andheri East, where we have about a 9,000 square foot space, which is packed with all sorts of equipment, like 3D printers, laser cutters, carpentry lab, welding lab, for people to come and explore and be able to build stuff just for uh, uh, hobbyists, enthusiasts, at the same time, hardware startups or artists to be able to use those tools, get access to them, and make their uh, uh, ideas come true or make physical products. However, over the time, a lot of people also started coming to us to try and learn how to use these tools and how to access them. And that's where the second and the main part of Maker's Asylum was born, uh, the educational part, which is where we focus on alternative uh, educational content. Uh, to sort of teach them bases on projects and uh, sort of uh, make them into problem solvers uh, by doing various sort of experiential programs which are fake focused on design thinking, frugal innovation, and uh, digital fabrication to be able to take uh, ideas into an actually living prototype and then possibly uh, take them forward. So we've been doing these kind of programs for the past uh, three years now, uh, which have uh, uh, got people from 15 different com countries to come down to Makers Asylum uh, for our program. And now we're also doing some of those programs in Paris and other countries as well, like Tokyo. And so it's pretty exciting how the entire movement around one part, which is access to space, and the other part, which is so You have one in education. Mumbai and one in Delhi, right? Is, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, we have three uh, physical locations. Uh, the main one is in Mumbai. We have a location, a smaller one in New Delhi. And the third one, which is recently launched in Jaipur, which is focused around textiles in partnership with the French Embassy. We'll come back to that as well, because that's a very important question as well. Mr. Guru Prasad Rao, GP affectionately known. <laughs> uh, I must say that I'm, uh, I, I'm a bit upset because I was uh, secretly hoping to write an article on Imaginarium, so, but it, because it's the best kept secret in India. But unfortunately, today it's going to be out. So uh, I want you to discuss more about you know, what Imaginarium is, which is an incredible uh, initiative and uh, company. Hey, so. You want me to uh, share the secret? No, 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 no you <laughs> exactly. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, In India, we have an open society. So. Is it working? Yes, yes. Um, I'm not getting feedback. OK, that's fine. So uh, well, uh, Imaginarium is a platform. Uh, we were a company. Uh, which was very transactional. You have a problem and we will solve it. Or uh, you have uh, a prototyping need and we prototype it. You know, so it was a very transactional in the beginning. Uh, but over the uh, period of time, we have become a, a truly platform, a water hole for uh, creative uh, people. You know, uh, it could be artists, it could be actors, directors, uh, medical doctors, children, uh, school uh, children, or even researchers who are having a dream what to make, but they don't have enough skill to make it, right? Or uh, many times, no, the ideas are so uh, fragile. And if you don't uh, take care of them, uh, they just vanish in thin air. So how to crystallize an idea and bring it to life? So that's what we do. We bring ideas to life. Uh, when we say it is uh, probably it is not very frugal in terms of value because it costs a lot of money uh, because most of the people who start with uh, properly uh, with a uh, maker asylum uh, kind of uh, space where they create things, when they want to take it to a kind of a, a pitch where they need to be funded at a higher level, uh, they need to actually make it, make things work. So when they want a product which doesn't look like, uh, not only look like real one, but work like a real one, then they approach us. We make that just one product which uh, not only looks like the real one, but works like a real one, right? And they, then they want uh, 10 pieces, 100 pieces. Now people are asking 1,000 
and a million. So we say, well, it, we, it's possible. So that's what we do at Imaginarium. Uh, and uh, uh, business, I think you have some questions on business uh, model and all. Which I, I think it will be just to important to clarify that it's a, the largest uh, network of 3D printing, right? Yes. Services in uh, India, just uh, as I was introduced, uh, we are uh, considered to be Asia's largest, still debatable. Uh, we are Asia's largest private uh, 3D printing company. I'll say it like that private 3D printing company. And uh, we have uh, 280 people, you know, 280 people to uh, serve all of you and the creators. Uh, many times uh, people have idea, they have no idea how to make it work. So we do co-creation with them. And they will have their IP, we don't participate in the IP journey, but we mentor them so that they can become successful as an entrepreneur, startups, and uh, create wealth for the company. And uh, I think uh, uh, creating uh, has been uh, very difficult earlier. 3D printing has made creation uh, a highly de-skilled one. You don't have to have the uh, skill of making things. As long as a digital model entity can be done, well, a robot makes it, and that robot we call it as 3D printer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, absolutely. Um, so I want to kind of still connect it back to the, the core topic of today, which is uh, frugal innovation. So I want to ask each of you uh, in which way your platform and uh, the business model you have is actually enabling frugal innovation, because frugal innovation is actually the ability to create solutions uh, five times faster, ten times cheaper using very limited resources. Uh, so, Mega, tell us more about that. I mean, in which way, uh, when you benchmark yourself with other similar services, what makes your business model so frugal? Um, I think the strength of Dharavi is um, you have smaller factories, but at the same time, you can expect assembly line production. And the way it works is, bec I mean, it's frugal because... Uh, of course, uh, space is a constraint, capital is a constraint. But at the same time, like where in the world do you have one single lane, a narrow by lane, uh, where you have everything which is required for a bag being produced in different houses. So every house in Dharavi is like a mini factory. So you have one person making the bags, you have the other one, the other house uh, selling raw materials and zips, then you have the third one just embossing logo on it because then there are specific machines required for that. Then there is one uh, which would just serve tea, uh, make a tea, coffee, lunch for all the workers uh, who are making these things. And then there'll be one who's just supplying cartons or driving the tempo or to take the, uh, take the bags to the end user. So every unit is responsible uh, for their own job. So they in a way specialize in, and plus the owner, uh, it's his benefit to actually optimize all the resources and make profit out of it. So they try the level best to you know do it in as little means as possible. At the same time, have a very systematic approach to uh, making bags and we've actually our largest order was 40,000 bags and we've done it in two months um, and these are Garigars who've n who are not educated they've they've not even uh, you know done their class two and uh, they've done all the calculation of all the materials required uh, and delivered on time without any uh, rejections or without any waste of material at a very cost effective price uh, I don't think so it's possible uh, anywhere else except in the Haravi. Fascinating. And also all these supplies are co-located, right? So the whole value chain is kind of right exactly. there. Exactly, so and they've yeah, created. So you right, have right. 10 lakh people living yeah. within a radius exactly, of two right, kilometers. Right, 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 right. And they've created this ecosystem on their own without yeah. any help from the government. Right, right. If you have a uh, problem, we can help yes. each other. It's so yeah, they've right, basically right. figured out uh, what they need to do uh, by themselves. And each one has utilized his own uh, knowledge Tal talent, to, yeah. uh, and his own talent uh, to figure out uh, a business and a livelihood for themselves. Fascinating. Thank you. So, Vaibhav, tell us about what makes Makers Asylum an enabler of frugal innovation. Uh, well, quite a few things. First of all, uh, a direct access to tools. So, having direct access to tools by itself is a very powerful way uh, to uh, enable a maker or a hardware 
startup or an artist to be able to uh, quickly and easily create what they want to create instead of uh, going to a service provider. Sorry, I'm just going to uh, say that over here because <laughs> we work a lot together. Uh, there's a lot of stories. But either which ways, uh, the point is that when I was as well at uh, Inetra, the startup that I was working at, we were building uh, 3D printed prototypes of our uh, device, which was a mobile eye diagnostic device to give you an eye test using a smartphone. But the entire structure of it was all 3D printed. Uh, back in the day, when I moved to India about th uh, that time, uh, uh, we did not have access to the 3D printers or the different sort of tools. And uh, there weren't any spaces or labs that you could get access to. And as a maker or as an uh, engineer, it's uh, so much easier to just work with the machines, figure out what's wrong in the final product, and then fix that little bit and then move forward. However, what I was stuck with at that point was to uh, having to work with various service providers in the area and uh, uh, then work with them, get the final product back. And then when you get the final product back, there's a huge lag in the time. Once you get the final product back, which is about a month later, you get the final product back, then you test it. And then you figure out there's one small piece, which is not, I need to change to make it a little better. Now, in that process, I have to go back through the entire process again. Uh, so that process, in the very early stages, before you go into the part where you actually get a service and make an actual prototype, uh, you're able to do at a space like Makers of Salem. And then you go to people like Imaginarium and take it forward in terms of having a final product. Uh, but we did not have that interim bit back in the day. So uh, Makers of Salem, was, was, the thought of it was to be able to create that space where uh, before people even have a final idea or a product or a prototype, they're able to experiment and mess around and have like, so we call it a playground for that reason. Uh, so it's a creative playground for people to come and explore and to be able to explore and even learn how to use 3D printing or even be able to just uh, make some small little things that you can use on a regular day basis, which maybe you won't ever go to a service provider to, uh, but at the same time want to be able to create. So that part of it enables that access to uh, equipment to engross that frugal mindset in that thought to say that, okay, fine, if I don't have that end product, I can go ahead and make it. Uh, that by itself is powerful, I think, uh, that I can, if I don't have uh, a table, I can make it. Or if I don't have a, a device that I want to make, but I can go ahead and make it myself. Right. And I have the tools and access to everything to be able to quickly and easily do that without a big fees to pay. Because we don't charge anyone for the 3D printers that they're using at the space. It's just a month long, fee in that way. The second part uh, that makes, I guess, uh, frugal innovation possible at Makers Asylum for all sorts of makers and people is that uh, the access to the community of other makers and early adopters. The fact that you're in a community or in a space which is full of other makers and club, uh, makers and creators, it's just so much easier to just go to the guy next door and say that, hey, I'm having some problem with electronics. Can you help me out? Uh, or I'm having a problem with uh, 3D printing this. The point is that everyone else is also learning and building at that space. And uh, that just makes it easier and feasible for people to just collaborate with each other. Uh, we are completely open source and open in our ways of working from that thought process. So that allows people to explore and create and move faster at uh, a very low cost at this space, uh, which is uh, one part of it which makes it very exciting. It's the learning which is faster and cheaper. Yeah, that's important people to understand. It's not just you make products faster, but you're Correct. learning fast. The learning curve gets you know, less steep because you share the knowledge. And, yeah. Correct. But and automatically, if the learning is faster, then uh, the making and the creation will become faster. If you're able to learn, uh, if you're constantly learning and creating, yes. then uh, automatically you're automatically always finding frugal and cheaper ways to create something yep. because your uh, knowledge base is always growing to right. find uh, ways to make things cheaper. Absolutely. Um, so GP, tell us more about uh, what makes uh, also Imaginarium an enabler of frugal innovation. If I'm an artisan or a doctor, you were talking about these uh, customers you serve. Why is it so, how are you making the solution more affordable for them? Well, I think uh, it's because uh, they're not investing too many, uh, too much of in, uh, in terms of tooling and all. Uh, 3D printing for the first time uh, makes things uh, which doesn't need any tool, uh, any mold. Mold is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Well, 
uh, 3D printing prints the object directly. That gives the power of uh, bypassing some of the processes which are otherwise, uh, you know, long drawn. You know, machining and then hardening it, polishing it, you know, those things. Um, just uh, going back to the what you uh, previously was uh, explaining about uh, uh, learning of uh, the creativity and how it makes creativity better, uh, probably uh, I think uh, learning uh, by peers, you know, informally, you know, is more uh, useful and uh, effective. Learning from bosses always is a problem. <laughs> Learning pr from professors, there is a mental block. <laughs> but uh, uh, learning informally Absolutely. with a colleague, uh, drawing concepts on uh, paper napkin in a um, informal coffee board, tea board, you know, uh, would make it uh, so easy, you know. Uh, and many people think uh, creation is such a complicated uh, word. Creativity is uh, another complicated word. But simply do it, just do it. How do you do that? You know, in some sense, uh, uh, doctors or scientists or engineers who come, they are uh, given more space to think while we take care of how to make it, don't worry about it. We take care of it. You think. And I, I think that's the uh, greatest uh, frugal thing. Uh, frugal in terms of making them richer in uh, idea space. I see. Right. Expand the idea space. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, expand the idea space wherein um, people in the… Uh, today, what makes the world is that one bright idea. It is not about who makes it, how they make it, whether they use 3D printer or not. Who cares? As long as it is reflecting what you thought and it is doing at its best, and uh, in the most efficient way, most frugal way. Mm -hmm. I think that's what matters. Mm -hmm. And today, thinking is more important that way. Making is going to take a back seat. And though making is important, we should believe we can make. I think the community spaces of what we heard about maker space or involvement with Dharavi, for example, where innovators are able to reach to the globe global market. These are some vehicles which uh, make ideas work. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I uh, might take on that. Great, so it will attract uh, not only uh, scientists or doctors, uh, everyone, they're able to realize, uh, when they realize their idea is wrong, they can do it quickly. Quick feedback gets back. Right, feedback. Right, right, right. So yeah. they, can, they don't have to spend a lot of money actually realizing that it doesn't work. Reducing risk of innovation as well. Exactly. Yeah, right. okay. So the frugality comes also from cutting down on costs by not wasting resources. Mm -hmm. That's a very important component yes. of uh, the whole journey. Especially if an entrepreneur or a designer. That's Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Jadeep, I want you to bring in, uh, he has been quiet for a while, so on. <laughs> uh, so Jadeep actually has studied a lot this maker movement in Europe, in the Western world. Um, and so tell us more about uh, what is driving the need for frugal innovation in the Western world and also how the maker movement actually connects with big. These are, seems like almost two different concepts, the maker movement and the frugal innovation. So can you connect the dots for us? Yeah. So first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here in Mumbai in such an entrepreneurial and creative city and such a wonderful audience in this space. Um, so, you know, we, as Nabi said, we wrote this book, Jogard Innovation, which was very much about innovation in India in places like Mumbai and it came out in 2012 and it was about how Western companies coming to India could learn from Indian innovators. And then when the book came out, we realized there was a lot of interest in this notion of frugal innovation in the West for the West. So we started to look at this and you know, to some extent it was driven by uh, post financial crisis in particular pressures on government budgets on household budgets you know so the western world was also learning to live with less uh, and do more with less but there were also some other drivers as you were indicating um, there were things that had happened uh, that were making it possible for small teams of people sometimes our students uh, to do things that only big companies or the government could have done 10 or 20 years yeah. ago 
Uh, and at the heart of that really was the rise of a type of consumer we call prosumers. You know, so these are not passive recipients of products and services. They're much more actively engaged in the economic process. And they're driving several major movements. One, the sharing economy, as Navi said, where we can trade spare assets directly with each other on some digital platform, and that's what you're doing in a sense. Sharing economy. Uh, the circular economy where companies and even consumers are figuring out how to reduce, reuse, and recycle. But perhaps the most impressive is the maker movement. And we've, you know, all of you are makers and you're enabling other makers. So what's this maker movement? So this is where, again, small teams can do things because they have access to spaces. And this is not just in software. You know, software has been happening before two guys in a bedroom coming up with WhatsApp, right? No, this is now even physical products, uh, smart products, Internet of Things products. They have access to spaces, make spaces, tech shops, fab labs, whatever you want to call it, where for a monthly fee they get access to all these tools, not just traditional tools, but also digital manufacturing tools. And most importantly, they get access to a community of like-minded people they can bounce ideas off. And so they're empowered to do this, and you see a whole host of things coming out of these uh, uh, maker spaces. So in Cambridge, small town, we have a make space right in the heart of town and our students who we think are learning from our professors are actually doing all kinds of things on their own, learning from each other. So one of my own students and a team of three other students, they had no technical knowledge but they had a vision of a problem they wanted to solve. They wanted to solve a problem in public health where often doctors will go to villages and they'll be giving vaccinations, but they don't know the identity of the person in front of them. They won't have records. The records will be in the district hospital. And the name will not help. So they said, they brainstormed this, uh, along with others in the make space, and they said, what if we could digitize, the, you know, use the fingerprint as an ID, digitize that visual content so that you can text it to the hospital, district hospital, they can pull up the record and text it back, and then the doctor knows, okay, this girl needs to have her vaccination. You know? They just had that idea, no technical knowledge, and in that maker space, they developed several prototypes, and in two or three years, they had got funding, they set up a company, and now they're doing massive trials of this in, in places like Bangladesh, in Rwanda, and so on. Uh, another very interesting example is the Raspberry Pi. How many people have heard of the Raspberry Pi? Not too many. Okay, there are a few at the back. Okay, how many people have used the Raspberry Pi? Okay, you've used it. Okay, a few people. So this was another idea that came out of the university. A former student of ours, Eben Upton, who was doing his EMBA in the business school, but he was also in the computer science department responsible for student admissions. And he had noticed that a lot of young people in the UK were not applying to study computer science. Fewer and fewer were applying. And even those who applied had never opened a computer to tinker with it. Uh, and they'd never done any coding. So his colleagues and he said, what if we can come up with a computer that's so basic that you'd have to tinker with it and you'd have to code and it'd be so cheap that if you broke it, it wouldn't be a big deal. So they came out with this Raspberry Pi, which was initially $30. They now have a $5 version. And they thought, you know, we'll sell a few thousand units. Uh, they've sold over 20 million. And who are they selling to? Not just kids. They're selling to the kids' parents, often their dads, who are makers, they're combining these with sensors and all kinds of other things and creating apps and Internet of Things solutions. So another student took the Raspberry Pi, he gave it a cladding, he called it Co-Learner, and he loaded it with the Khan Academy. Do people know the Khan Academy? It's the entire US school curriculum available in video form on YouTube for free. And he said lots of kids around the world don't have access to the Internet and uh, they don't have access to PCs, but they'll have access to a TV. So you can connect this Raspberry Pi with the Khan Academy to a TV and watch the content. And you can do peer-to-peer -peer learning. So you know, it goes on like this. Uh, now the question is, you know, what does this mean for big companies and big organizations? How can they tap into it? Fascinating. Uh, I want to make sure at some point we engage the audience as well to uh, field some questions. Um, I actually want to ask one question to um, the panelists, which is, uh, how does the maker movement connect with uh, the topic of sustainability. We talked about climate change, which is a clear and present danger. So um, when you think about maker movement, on one hand, you might say, well, making is interesting, but does that mean that we produce more and more stuff as well? Because we have an idea, as you said, you know, I can just go to Imaginarium and you know, design something, and up, I get something 3D printed, shipped around. 
So how do we make sure that the maker movement is also sustainable? Um, so can you comment on the link between what you're doing and sustainability as well? Mega? Uh, so Dharavi, uh, because of uh, the issue of funding, uh, already recycles and reuses a lot. Uh, so most of the leather, which is just leftover leather from bags or vegan leather, uh, they are sold by the kilo in local shops in Dharavi, and then those are used to make keychains and smaller items, you know, like the the sole of the shoe or something like that. So uh, a lot of machines um, are secondhand. In fact, most of the sewing machines are secondhand in Dharavi. Again, it's because of the cost. Uh, so there is a lot of recycling already happening in Dharavi. In terms of products, uh, we do try, I mean, we've uh, collaborated with NIFT, and we're hoping the designers would use their creativity to use the existing um, waste and turn it into different products. That's not my forte, uh, but we're trying to do that. And uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, we'll have whatever little bit of waste is still there, we'll still reuse it. And, uh, but the inputs can also be waste, uh, the upcycling, right? You can actually take you know, waste kind of as well and Yes, so we up. are doing that. So a lot right. of... Um, in terms of making bags, I mean, there are people who are extremely creative and they've come up with uh, during uh, Ganpati Visarjan, like after uh, the festival is over, th th you have flex everywhere because of these pandas. Right. So people have come up with flex and they've said, that, could you turn them into bags for us? And we've done it. Uh, so if uh, people come up with ideas, uh, we try our level best to execute it. Uh, but. Uh, so far, because we are still very young, so far the creativity has come from uh, somewhere outside and because we have craftsmen, we can execute it. So the ideas come from outside and we've executed it. Okay, very good. Baiba, what's the link between uh, Makers Asylum? I know that there are a couple of things you guys are doing there which you may want to share. So I thought about three after I got that question. One of, uh, one of them is that we have junkyards in every lab. So we have uh, five labs at the asylum. And for example, the 3D printing lab or the wood shop, every lab has a little junkyard that we keep out there. Because uh, somebody's junk is always somebody else's treasure. We've we call it the treasure box. And uh, uh, so people, instead of throwing away their stuff, come and donate to the asylum. A lot of the equipment over there at Makers Asylum is also donated by a lot of uh, uh, retired engineers and professors from colleges. Uh, and we love that stuff because somebody once donated us about 30 motors and all of those motors are used now. But uh, we've been getting all those things, they come to the treasure box, that's what we call it, and people are able to use them whenever they want, uh, freely. They're just kept in all the labs. That's one way. Second thing that we do is we uh, do a lot of upcycling workshops as uh, with our partners. So just recently we did one with Blue Tokai and uh, another one with Start Foundation, the ones they're painting all sorts of buildings. And in Delhi, where uh, we take all our electronic waste that we've accumulated from all the things that we break and take apart. And then we take all of that electronic waste uh, to artists and uh, make small little installations out of them, whether it be uh, a lamp or a few little toys, and they're able to take that home. And uh, that's powerful in its own ways that they're taking something that's upcycled and taken home. And the third uh, that sort of comes to mind is uh, one of the recent projects that a bunch of us at Makers Asylum worked on uh, and I was personally involved with as well was a CSR project that we did with Hindustan Unilever. And uh, they came up to us and they said that how do we teach uh, recycling to kids? And how do we take uh, recycling inside the schools? And so we had earlier worked on a mobile uh, maker lab uh, which where we took a rickshaw and we gave it gulping doors like a Lamborghini and put tools inside it and took it to a lot of schools to teach robotics. So now what we did in the second version of that, which we call the Plastic Safari uh, as a partnership project between HUL, Makers of Salom and Zentio, uh, we uh, were able to put a full plastic recycling unit inside a Tempo. So we took a, res uh, a shredder, uh, so we actually completely fabricated the shedder at Makers Asylum using the precious plastics designs which are available online. And uh, it's an open source project. So we took the pro uh, parts, we water jet cut them, laser cut parts of it, uh, built and constructed the entire assembly where you 
pretty much take a water bottle, throw it inside, shreds it into small little plastic pieces, and then we built an extruder with it that uh, basically takes all this uh, shredded plastics and puts it in the extruder to bring out a little thread of plastic. And that you're able to take on the other side of the tempo, where we put a 3D printer and a lot of 3D pens. So the kids can actually take that plastic and now put it inside 3D pens or inside the 3D printer and see what they can make out of it. So you're able to see the entire process uh, within a simple lab and take it around. And this lab has now gone to over about 30 to 35 schools already and uh, taught over 10,000 students, at least showed them how this process can work. Well, how the process works in the industry and how they can uh, sort of uh, easily and simply take plastic and make amazing, beautiful products out of it. Fascinating. Thank you. GP, tell us about uh, the link between uh, your activities and uh, the circular economy and sustainability. Circular economy, okay. I think I, my idea of circular economy is uh, cradle to cradle and cradle to grave where uh, you can recycle completely or if you are able, not able to recycle, at least uh, you need to safely dispose it. Um, as uh, we can see, many of the industrial produce things which are uh, pollutants actually, they are uh, not uh, just a virgin material, but they come with a lot of other uh, materials called composites. And uh, these composites make it hard to recycle, you know. so. Uh, my honest view is, uh, as a company, uh, whatever we actually uh, print, they are misprinted, wrongly printed, print which has stopped in between. I cannot show it to anyone because it is somebody's IP, you know. So we do uh, trash them and give it to recycling agencies. As a company, we produce a lot of such waste, right? And uh, if something is uh, not printed properly, uh, probably I cannot uh, give it to anyone because it is somebody's IP and uh, they have right over it, you know. So uh, we have to trash them and uh, try to recycle them. But I don't see recycling as a process, uh, it can be fed back to my mission, which are very uh, sophisticated. So. Uh, because of the material science involved, uh, recycling is not so easy. So what we do is we find appropriate agencies who have the capability to digest them and recycle them. You know, that's what we do. Electronic waste also we have. For example, we have a lot of electronic circuitry which get uh, uh, to be replaced sometimes. For that also e-waste, uh, we give it to the agency which will recycle, you know. and. Uh, the concept of uh, bioplastics, PLA, polylactic acid, and all are there, but uh, they don't uh, uh, work for the real life. Many times, they, they cannot sustain the engineering strength required to make a product, right? And so, for a prototype make, made of PLA, probably um, it's okay, but if I want to sell it, probably I will not be able to warranty, guarantee, and uh, uh, you know, uh, promise the uh, end uh, efficiencies what it may deliver. Uh, for these reasons, I think we are not uh, looking at it uh, for imagining full, itself. Full circle, yeah. Right, but right. in Dharavi, we have a, uh, a NGO which is uh, collecting all plastics. They are doing a very uh, scientific recycling. And there we are, we have joined hands as an industry partner to validate the filament, you know. If they want to make, then uh, somebody has to validate and watch and uh, uh, look at the characterization of material, which are very, com you know, uh, uh, scientific. And to say that, yes, this is recycled and uh, it's still it's good for use, right? That kind of thing. So it's an extra imaginarium work, uh, social work we are doing. Uh, otherwise, uh, inside Imaginarium, we are not uh, planning. But uh, I think uh, what we do is, ideas can be recycled. Right, of course. Ideas can be recycled, and uh, one need to use them as a primitive, to building as a building block, uh, and make several things, uh, which are a synthesis, you know. So, if you have a CAD model, uh, probably this CAD model can be modified, to make a new one, 
Okay. So this is what I call it as idea recycling. Sure. And once it is done, it is always there with you. Right. Right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so I want to see if uh, there are any questions from the audience because you have been kind of uh, interacting. Yes, please. So we have uh, mics. So I'm going to start. Uh, sorry. Yeah. No. 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 Let's not do that. The Indian way. Let's let's make sure we everybody properly hears that. So. Yes, if you can also introduce yourself briefly and then ask the question, that will be good. Yeah, and uh, yeah, keep the question brief as well. Thank you. So the mics are coming up. So I will check. Uh, well, my name is Mudit Jain. I'm a businessman. Uh, I'm no, I don't have a sci uh, science background, but to me, nature is the best scientist. So my question is, is biomimicry like, you know, playing a part in your innovation, things like, you know, uh, imitating nature, but then whether it's practical and possible, maybe pharmaceuticals or some other material testing have applications. Anyone has any views on that? Uh, well, uh, in pharma, people are uh, uh, trying to make drugs, you know, by 3D printing. Uh, why 3D printing? One may ask. I have a very interesting uh, realization. Uh, if you have a sandwich, you, uh, you put a tomato, it becomes a tomato sandwich. You remove, you put cucumber, it becomes a cucumber sandwich. You put ham, it becomes a ham sandwich. Well, what we call these as functionally graded material, you know. So in a drug release, uh, printing layer by layer has a lot of advantage in drug elution. So every six hours, a drug is supposed to get released to get you a better uh, treatment or uh, better health. So how, did, how do they do it? They have a layer which is going to disintegrate after some hours. Then you have the active drug material. Okay, that's one aspect of printing drugs. The second one is all of us are unique people. Uh, we have a, a different body mass index. So f uh, drug manufacturers have dyes which makes only 100 mg, 200 mg. Y you want 107 mg for example. It is not possible. So people are thinking of printing drugs on demand. I think uh, it's a very good idea and it is going to come. Uh, people have tried it, concept proving has already been done. And uh, the functionally graded material is the concept uh, is very good and that is uh, going to disrupt many things. Healthcare is very important. Uh, you know, uh, a beneficiary of that. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, Ready? if I may just point out, I think 3D printing itself is an example of biomimicry. So if you think about spiders, they extrude a material and spin a web through a kind of additive manufacturing or bees make uh, hives through that. So they extrude a material and then by putting layer upon layer, they create a structure. And that's exactly the idea of 3D printing. It's additive. Uh, so you, it's not subtractive and therefore you don't have waste and you can actually do many more uh, intricate patterns than you could from subtractive manufacturing. So it literally is an example of biomimicry in action and it's also frugal because you can do things, you can do better with less. Other question? Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Jay. I'm a student pursuing chartered accountancy and have my own startup called Cupable, wherein we make uh, recyclable, unbreakable glasses like these, made of plastic. Um, I have a broader question, a particularly broader question, wherein uh, the idea of frugal innovation. So to be a frugal innovator, uh, do I need to be more of a polymath, where I'm uh, good at everything? Or do I need to be more, uh, do I need to be the best in the class? For example, someone like Manu Prakash, who built a uh, fo Foldscape, the one dollar microscope, microscope yeah. uh, so he was the master of that particular field or to be uh, or to be a frugal innovator do I need to be a polymath where I don't I not only go into the depth of something but I also discover the width of uh, anything else so thank you uh, I don't think so you need to uh, be a master of everything. You, uh, you you need to figure out what your strengths are and there are collaborations. The best part about my job is collaborations. I don't know how to make a bag. I Like I said, I'm a journalist, urban planner, so I didn't know sales, marketing, nothing. But I've learned the, the reason I did this was I wanted to get to a solution. I wanted a solution to help the craftsmen uh, 
I mean, from an urban planning point of view also, I wanted people uh, of Dharavi to have negotiating power when it comes to their rights to housing. But I thought that till the time they, n they look down as encroachers, they're not going to be uh, taken seriously. And to bring them to mainstream, uh, you know, their economy, their work, their skills had to be out there. So it all started from there, and that's, I mean, I never thought that I would actually sell bags and shoes online. Uh, but uh, the whole point of this movement, where I've just started with a website, is actually to give them an identity and uh, give them a bigger say when it comes to their rights, when it comes to their education, their housing. Uh, so what I've learned and whatever I've done in the last four years is all through collaborations. Like I've tied up with NIF to get more designs. Uh, then I've tied up uh, with my journalism uh, school, which is BMM uh, students for uh, getting sales and marketing. Uh, so you have to uh, figure out how you can associate with people and help solve problems. Because I personally, um, I don't have technical knowledge about anything, whether it was creating a website or creating a bag or s uh, sales or marketing. But the whole point is, uh, like, I'm just trying to bring people together to find an end solution. I think Vaiba I maybe have a very radical answer to that, which is, uh, <laughs> you, I want you to be uh, controversial. No, no, no. You, 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 know, you have to be con Go ahead, because I want to people to hear from you, like the fact that people who come to make asylum, they are not coming as the experts, right? I think you really have to explain that the important point, so. Yeah, I think uh, most of the people that I've met at uh, the space are not probably experts of one field. And uh, all of us also call ourselves uh, master of none, jack of all, in a way. Uh, but uh, I think what helps is to be able to explore new, different uh, uh, ways of doing stuff. That really helps. Once you have a big, nice, today in this world of uh, so many experts, in a way, that I would say, and uh, the fact that in this world of uh, uh, so many things that have already been created, uh, it helps a lot to be able to uh, having the knowledge of them. Once you have knowledge of different, different fields, you're able to sort of intermix them. And uh, the interdisciplinarity approach towards uh, solving problems is always exciting. I can personally give one short story or example. Uh, I'll be really quick. I don't want to take too much sure, time. Sure. But uh, I'm a mechanic. I, when I studied engineering, I studied mechanical engineering. I, wasn't, I was never good at school. But I uh, did mechanical engineering after that. But I did mechanical engineering and photography. Uh, two uh, very, very different crazy topics. And everyone told me, what are you doing? What are you, mechanical engineering, photography doesn't make any sense. But they led to my first job, uh, which was in uh, uh, Boston uh, uh, Micro Machines, where we were working with capturing light coming from different stars and galaxies, which had a lot to do with optics. And also my second job, which was about uh, working with eye diagnostics and uh, creating a device to give, give you sort of uh, an eye test using a smartphone. I probably wasn't the best mechanical engineer out there, but the fact that there was uh, the approach of uh, being a photographer where I had the idea of light and how light worked, uh, that just made it a game changer for this startup to want me in their team. And uh, uh, that exposure to having uh, not just one specific expertise, but the fact that we were able to uh, sort of, well, I guess at that point I was able to have uh, a variety of knowledge uh, is what was valuable in that aspect. And when it comes to frugal innovation or uh, creation, that is something that helps a lot. It's not the expertise in one specific domain, but the ability to be able to have various different kinds of knowledge and sort of uh, be able to find the fastest, easiest solution using all of them, or sort of uh, be able to use something which wouldn't have been uh, probably the most common and easy answer to it. I don't know, okay. but I'd like to hear your views. No, 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 I, you, you answered already. But the only thing I say controversially these days is that 20th century knowledge was power, 21st century ignorance is power. <laughs> if, if, if you look at all the disruptors, right, Uber CEO, you know, Airbnb, they knew nothing about transportation, nothing about hospitality. So the less you know, the less you are an expert, the easier to disrupt. But industry. you need to know about the problem. The problem. You need to be an expert right. of the problem right. you're trying to solve, so, and yeah. you need to really so care need, about right. solving that problem. You need to that care about the, the problem. You become yeah. the expert of the problem, not the yeah. expert of the solution. Yeah. So.
Uh, who would raise the hand? I want to be democratic. So <laughs> the lady, I will, I will come to you next. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Navi. So uh, in your line of work, you would have come across a lot of frugal innovators. But what, in your opinion, does it take to um, actually make it a commercial success? Right? I mean, how do you take an innovation from something that's fantastic to actually making money for the entrepreneur? And uh, you know, specifically, uh, Webhav, yours, uh, your venture sounds fairly egalitarian. I mean, how do you plan to make money from uh, Maker's Asylum? I would be interested in know. You want to uh, go ahead? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I think. Uh, well, uh, Maker's Asylum started with a very idealistic thought to creating a common neutral ground and hence started as a foundation. However, we are now a hybrid model. And uh, my partner over there, she's uh, got better answers to uh, the money part. But uh, what we do a lot now is alternative education. And so one of our programs, for example, is called uh, the SDG School or the STEAM School, which brings together 150 people from 15 different countries. All the universities that they come from pay us uh, to have them get this experience in India and out our space to be able to go through that entire process. So most of our programs are experiential and universities are funding us to be able to uh, send their students. So we're actually technically building curriculum, not just for uh, uh, programs that we do at Makers Asylum, but for a lot of universities around the world and uh, giving them ways to be able to uh, teach uh, and use their labs. So uh, for example, uh, as for Makers Asylum, we've now slowly, slowly been building a system of education, a system of alternative education. Uh, we call it MASH, uh, as of now, Makers Asylum System of Hacking, where we have like a four-year-long curriculum uh, for a person to go from an explorer into a tinkerer, into a maker, and probably into a grandmaster of making. Uh, and then uh, this sort of a curriculum that we've sort of been developing in the back end, uh, which has everything, which is completely project-based and has uh, uh, been very well, uh, takes the maker or the individual through a journey of not just uh, making, but also the f uh, philosophies of being a maker uh, and uh, be able to share things. And that sort of a thing is what we see as a model of education that makes Makers Asylum sustainable as an organization uh, going forward. So there were three men who asked the question. I want to be really like fair here. So no, before you, I want to make sure we, we give the voice to the mic to at least the lady first. So. Hi, yeah. Uh, so my name is Asmita. I work uh, with Zone Startups Plus and Accelerator for their impact programs. Uh, but prior to that, I had been working uh, individually on some of the NIF uh, projects to scale, uh, as you said, uh, some of the products. And what I had seen as a major challenge as, uh, so there is a scalability issue that we often talk about. How do you make the product scalable? And a lot of solutions have come around it, manufacturing the products and all. But the journey of an innovator to turn into an entrepreneur, what kind of challenges do you see and how do you solve them? Sure. Jadeep, actually, you want to take a crack? <laughs> well, so, so I think you know, that's also linked to the question of how do you make money and so on. And it's linked to the question of scaling. And there are a whole host of ways in which you can scale. So one is if you are the innovator and you want to uh, be the entrepreneur and take that idea, you can do it yourself. That, is, as we know, is a long and hard journey. That's a long, hard journey. And there are a lot of pitfalls. But now there are accelerators and incubators and mentors that can help you, you know, to uh, learn from their mistakes. And you can accelerate the process. So that's one way, and universities have these accelerators and so on. Um, but you know, even then, you might hit a wall. Uh, and often, entrepreneurs are wonderful at coming up with the initial solution, you know, trying out different things, experimenting. They know the problem really well. They're co committed to solving it. They come up with an initial solution, but then they may not have the resources to scale it, to, get, you know, to take the word to more people, to develop the distribution networks if it's a physical product. Now, increasingly, small teams even have resources, have access to those resources. So we often talk about this uh, 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 
four student team from Northwestern Chicago called Design for Change. And they came up with this device to uh, address this problem of hospital acquired infections where people go to hospital to get cured but they actually pick up an infection and then they die. Lots of people die from this process. And so they came up with this device uh, which they prototyped in their own studio with a 3D printer and so on. And then the next step was, oh, we don't have a factory. How do we make this, right? So they outsourced the manufacturing. Oh, we don't have a budget. How do we get some money? Oh, we crowdfund it. So they did a Kickstarter. They got some money. We don't have a sales force. How do we distribute this? Well, they listed it on Amazon, and Amazon does the distribution for them. We don't have an advertising budget. You know, what do we do? Well, that's social media. So, you know, there are even a small company with limited resources now has access to these ubiquitous tools and resources that can help them do the whole thing, including the commercialization process. But even if, even if that fails, uh, large companies are very interested in your ideas because often they don't have the ability, the time, the resources, and the, simply the creativity in that fuzzy front end where people are, like you will be experimenting, coming up with solutions. So they're very happy for you to do all that initial work and then when you hit a wall, they're happy to take over, either licensing it or acquiring you, and then they bring all their resources to bear and scale. So there are a number of paths to profits and scaling, uh, either yourself with your team or through large companies. This, <coughs> this however, one thing, we just, we, Jadeep and I met with the CEO of Unilever, Industan Unilever, Sanjeev Mehta this afternoon. He said something very profound. His, his advice to entrepreneurs, we asked him, what do you want us to say to, entrepreneurs, he said, very not about valuation, very about value you create in a society. So I just want to you know, share that. So that's also important. So who was uh, next in the, yes. My name is Dharmendra Rai. I train on a subject called mind mapping and a few other subjects. So my question is for everybody, but especially for uh, Navi and uh, Jadip. Isn't there a cultural bias against frugal innovation both from manufacturers or buyers on one side and the consumers on the other side. For example, governments don't want frugal innovation. They want to spend a lot of money and impress people with large and pretty useless infrastructure projects. Uh, uh, company executives want to spend a lot of money on R&D because it makes them important. That's on one side. And the other side is consumers don't want to buy products which involve frugal innovation because they don't want to show their Facebook friends that they're poor. So Mitikul and Nano, I'm sure, would have sold much more if that bias wasn't there. So how do you handle these biases in so many places? Yes. So I'm going to address the, I think uh, Jadip is a professor of marketing, so he will talk about the, the importance of uh, making a frugal product, what we call aspirational. So um, we actually think that the problem with the Nano is that it was positioned as the world's cheapest car, the poor man's car. So, so that kind of positioning essentially hurts you know, the kind of the perception of the frugal solution. So clearly the way you position the frugal product, uh, and yes, some interesting example to share, and actually we are heading to Goa on Saturday, uh, there is the, the a big Ad event, Go Goa Fest, which is the association of all the advertising companies. And our message to them is that actually, you know, your job in coming years in India is to help brands position the frugal solutions as being very cool and aspirational. Okay, so clearly marketing, advertising is going to play an important role in how you communicate the aspirational value of the frugal solutions. You're absolutely right. I mean, uh, we see a lot of large companies actually have trouble with frugal innovation because um, they are used to actually spending billions of dollars in coming up with very complex solutions. Um, so it's kind of uh, going backward for them, you know, to come up with something very simple. But GE actually has done very well. I mean, out of India, they actually came up with a very uh, uh, limited budget. Um, and, and, and they came up with these uh, low-cost medical devices. Uh, Renault Nissan similarly set up you know, a very small team and uh, with very limited budget. So when you do create that kind of structure where you constrain on resources, you remove the limitation on creativity. So we see more and more multinationals understanding that you know, in the future, you don't have to just throw money at you know, problems and hope that something comes out. Uh, it's much more productive if you actually create an environment where actually um, you kind of uh, not starve, but make resources more limited. And suddenly this whole Juga spirit, you know, comes up. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a comprehensive answer. But all I would say is that, you know, there are 
aspects of frugality both on the demand side and the supply side as you identified. And on the demand side, you know, uh, it's about affordability rather than just frugality. So, you know, you're not trying to be mean or cheap, but you're trying to make something affordable and then you have to go beyond that, you know, so you have to think about what else it's doing for people. So the affordability is a hygiene factor. This is the point about value. What value are you generating? And I, you know, I go back to when Nokia in their pomp dominated emerging markets. They came up with things like that, you know, 1100 series phone, which was a highly affordable, robust phone. But they also got insights from actually working, living with people in Dharavi. They noticed that people in urban slums around the world were buying mobile phones, even though they were very expensive. And one of the things they were doing was using that very weak light in the phone to see their way in the dark. So they took that insight back and then came up with the flashlight in, in, in the phone, the torch. And that was a killer app. So it was an affordable phone, but it was also one that had features that were very relevant to people generating value for them. And you know, so there's that aspirational aspect. The affordability is just a hygiene factor so that they can participate in that market. But what else are they getting? So that's on the demand side. And of course, you bring to bear all the uh, weapons of behavioral science to get people to adopt and use and value those things. But equally on the supply side, you're right. Large companies typically you know, go for the big budget. That's what innovation has meant for the 20th century. It's bigger is better. You have big R&D teams, you know, long-term projects, technology for the sake of technology, and then you charge customers for it. And that, of course, is changing because of emerging markets, because of Chinese and Indian companies that are generating these very affordable solutions across the board for their large uh, home markets, but then challenging the multinationals in those home markets, like medical devices, forcing them to rethink their approach in order to survive in emerging markets, but tomorrow in the West, because you know those Chinese and Indian competitors are going to take the battle to them in the West. So they're having to, against their instincts, uh, take up uh, frugality. Now, the thing is that you can be very frugal in your manufacturing and innovation processes, but you don't have to pass those savings on to the consumer. You can still have healthy margins, right? So that's up to you, that you can make a decision. So, you know, a very large uh, Indian company did precisely that in automotive and did very well with a very high-end product applying uh, frugal innovation on the manufacturing and design side. So. Uh, you know, there are these obstacles, but then there are also real competitive pressures and there are real, uh, you know, needs. And that's just talking about affordability. We haven't gone into things uh, like resources. You know, the availability of resources, no matter how big and successful a company you are, take IKEA, they know that in 10 years' time, they already struggle to get virgin materials to make uh, their furniture. In 10 years' time, it'll be even harder to get access to that. So their own business depends on them having access to these assets. And so they are thinking now not of selling you furniture, but renting it to you so they retain control of the physical assets, which they can recycle and reuse. So uh, frugality is not just about affordability. It's about the longevity, the sustainability, long-term sustainability of scarce resources. One last question, maybe from a lady. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Heeta and I work mainly on the field of climate change education with young people. I'd like to come back to the beginning of where we began from climate change in the SDGs uh, and how you said that you know 50% of the work for the SDGs has to come from India if we need to go sustainable. Uh, I have a couple of questions but I'm trying to frame them really well. Uh, so one is the population of the country. Uh, we have a huge population with a lot of young people. So if we need to go sustainable, our young people need to go sustainable. So how do we make sure that we involve the young people in such a way that they realize that sustainability is not just something that you talk about to sound cool, but sustainability has to be a way of life, right from everything that I wear until whatever I'm working in, until I consume everything. It has to be a bottom-up approach. And another question is kind of similar to what he said was how, how, you know, bigger is better, like what you were talking about right now. Um, if the country needs to go sustainable, it needs to have backing from the government. The government needs to believe that we have to be eco-friendly or sustainable and think and take development in that sense. Uh, so it's a multi-pronged approach. How do you, one, of course, bottom-up deal with the consumers themselves, especially the young people, but how do you also sort of push the government 
to not just talk about it, but also actually act. And this probably a right moment to think about the government since the elections are voting today, but it's not one party versus the other, it's just that in general, the country does not think about environment um, as a forefront, which it should be considering the number of people, number of people and the vulnerability that we have in our country. So how do we sort of tackle those sure. issues? Um, I would maybe, Vaibhav, you want to talk about the STEAM school, this would be a fantastic, you know, place to uh, talk about that, how you're helping young people to actually not just learn about sustainability, but actually be part of the solution as well, so. Uh, so, uh, like Navi mentioned, one of the programs that we do is called STEAM School. Uh, it's a 10 day long program uh, that focuses on, uh, well, starts by talking about the UN sustainability goals and uh, teaching people what is all of that all about. And then going into uh, a sort of a design thinking approach towards uh, coming up with various different problem statements and solutions that they can work on it uh, themselves. They also go out to various field studies, including places like Dharavi and a lot of other places around Mumbai, schools, colleges, universities, uh, hospitals to look at some of their assumptions and whether their problems are actually valid. Coming back, coming up with frugal innovation, uh, frugal uh, solutions for them, and then learning about uh, the tools at the lab to come up with exciting solutions for them and possibly making them into startups or uh, taking them forward. This program we've been running for now three years. Uh, happens every year at uh, Maker's Asylum. Brings together about 150 people from across the world for this program. Uh, this year we're also doing it in Paris in July. So it's, it has been catching some momentum. But uh, like Navi mentioned, the agenda of the program since the start was always to uh, start this conversation and bring in people together who want to uh, well work on sustainability and find ways to uh, uh, change the world in a way and uh, give them uh, put them together with other like-minded people in the same room that if everyone's thinking the same way then it is possible that we can uh, come up with new innovative solutions to uh, make a difference as a together yep. yes. Also, Plastic Safari, you know, you were talking about the van. You also have a curriculum. I saw that there's a, there's a curriculum and there are materials for school children. So you're starting really early, right? So when you go, the van goes, you hand out these, and then you, they get assi assignments, the take-home assignments. They'll, they go and tell their parents how to sort uh, wet from dry waste and stuff. I don't know if you want to add something on that. Precisely. Uh, that's the curriculum that we work with in partnership with NTO and they uh, come up with this entire beautiful curriculum uh, to not only talk about uh, what they can, uh, what plastic recycling is about, but at the same time how they can involve that in their day-to-day -day life and uh, how to be able to uh, sort of make that difference at the early age and go back and talk to their parents about that. Make that interesting and cool in a way. Put that at a higher level. Make it interactive, make it exciting for them to go back and have that discussion uh, with their families or with their schools even and ask the right questions. That's sort of... Uh, uh, what we nudge them towards through these programs and pretty much all of our programs now are aligned towards uh, uh, the sustainability side or at least getting them talking yes. towards UN sustainability. Right, right, and find some solutions as well, not just to talk about it. Uh, I think the reason we are launching this book to conclude on this as well, this whole event is actually we were dissuaded from launching in April with elections happening but that's because of your second part of the question, because we do think that we need to bring this awareness to policymakers that, you know, uh, yes, entrepreneurs can do great things, companies can do great things, but we need to have a, a regulatory framework, legal framework, and, uh, you know, policy framework to support that. And for example, in China, the circular economy has actually been embedded in their five, ten year roadmap, economic roadmap. So they already know that, you know, the way they have done the industrial uh, kind of economic growth in the last ten years is not sustainable. So this idea of circular economy has been actually baked into their development plan for the next 10 years. They also have a goal by 2020 to have 20% of the economy to be based on the sharing economy, for example. So of course, China is a, is a communist country. You can do that in a top-down fashion. Uh, but in India, what we are seeing and we would like to talk more about actually in the future is like how can we maybe, maybe not from a national level, a national level, but maybe there are many initiatives that can be done at the regional level, or state level, city level. So think like, you know, in uh, Telangana or Andhra Pradesh, I forgot, like this called zero budget farming, right? Where they're trying to actually grow more rice, et cetera, with less water and less fertilizers. So we see incredible initiatives happening now more and more at the regional level. 
And that's what excites us because you know, there are many Indias, you know, they're not one India. So probably we don't need one policy. We need many policies that are adapted in all two different regions. So I, with that, I want to uh, thank you for your attention. I think our panelists were fantastic. I mean, they shared some incredible insights. Uh, go check out the Dharavi Market products. They are out there. Uh, they are really beautiful. And uh, Vaiba brought some interesting uh, products made at uh, Makers Asylum. You can check them out here as well. And uh, we'll be hanging out, you know, in the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes. So you can interact with them informally as well. So. You can buy our book as well. Yes, thanks, Jadip. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a very poor salesman, you see, so that's the problem. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>